My next project is to build a little handbrake wheel and assembly. This is based on a prototype that I've seen on several old flat cars. The basic assembly is a square shaft with a handbrake wheel on top. And then there's a little strap on the bottom that you can kick over and this brake wheel will pop down and sit flush with the deck of the flat car. I also wanted it to look like it was functional. And so I've got a serrated lock washer as my ratcheting mechanism. And then I made these little, the, the pawl and the, and the little weight here that keep it on just out of scrap material. So this uh, weight would flip over like that and it puts pressure on the end of the pawl and then that engages. And when you want to kick off the handbrake, you flip this to the other side, crank this backward just a little bit. The function of this would be to wind up on a drum that would be down here with a chain around it. Here's a photo of the prototype with the parts I just described. This mechanism is a little bit different, but some of the other ones I've seen have a more obvious strap on the bottom that allows you to release that handbrake shaft and lower it down to the level of the deck. Our first step is going to be the frame. You can see it's just a simple piece of L angle steel. And then we've got kind of a bracket here that's been sculpted with my flapper wheel that holds an upper shelf, which is just a big washer. So that's simple enough to make. Then we'll weld that shape up and then we'll cut a tube in here that fits. These are two sections of tubing just blob welded on to the inside. The brake wheel itself is not too difficult. This is just a piece of square stock and uh, an old water faucet handle. So I'll have to dig through the plumbing drawer and see if I can find a handle. I found a suitable piece of angle steel and I've noticed that this isn't exactly a square dimension so the bottom leg is longer than the top so probably what I did is just cut that down to make room for this upper assembly here. The other thing I noticed when I did this one that mounting bolt hole is a little bit hard to get to and there's no reason why I can't make this a little wider so I'm going to make this one slightly wider on this side so that I've got room for that. I like to cut the angle steel facing up like a pyramid like this because uh, it's more stable and it allows the blade to go through two thicknesses all the way down. If you cut it with the flange facing up, it'll go through the flange really quick and sometimes it can snag the blade and try to roll it depending on which way you have it clamped and it, it'll take chunks out of your blade like I did right here. So this is how I prefer to do it. Doink. I found this piece in the scrap bin. It very well could be the complement to this. I, I cut a V-shaped groove for whatever reason, but this gives me a nice start for that pattern. So I'll take that off and trace it out with a, a scribing tool. And if I really want to get crazy, I could use the blue layout flu fluid, but I don't think I need that. I could probably get the Paul. Actually, I'll get it right out of here because that's got a nice curve on it already, too. So that'll save me a little bit of time. So that covers those two pieces. I've got this nice thick piece that will make an upright here with a little bit of contouring. I can round the corner off. I've got a little bit thinner piece that will form this upright here. I do need to make this strap, but I can just find a little piece of of thin steel for that. And I also found this piece of rotisserie. It's a, a barbecue rotisserie and it happens to be the same size as this square stock. So I'll cut the ends off to the appropriate height. This is the pawl and here's the little weight that keeps it engaged. So I'm gonna trace that out with this little scribe. And I'll go cut it out on the bandsaw. If you really want to have a technical tracing, you can use some machinist blue paint or dye that, that colors this and it makes really nice clear scratch lines with your scribe. This is called Dichem Steel Blue Layout Fluid, D-Y-K-E-M comes in a brush bottle format or a rattle can. So if you're trying to get a precision part, it's a nice way to go about it. In this case, we're gonna do a lot of this by eye because that's how I did the first one. 
and I don't need to exactly replicate these. The trick is to just go nice and easy. There's no rush. It's about as tight a curve as you can go with the bandsaw blade. But it's working okay. Let's come around the outside here. So then if you want to do tight curves, you have to nibble away. I have to give myself access to this side. And for this dog bone, I'll probably just cut it straight across. And I'll come back and finish it with the angle grinder. We'll find that later. All right, well, let's go find our pieces. I have to clean out my scrap bin. Let's see if we can find it in here. Look at that. After I cleaned out my whole scrap bin, I realized maybe it never hit the ground. Probably the best way to do this now is with hand tools because I can control the shape a lot easier. That gives me a nice controllable cut. I'm not applying too much pressure. I just want to let the tool do the work, as they say. Let's see how we're doing here. That's not bad. But just a little bit more. Try to feather in these edges a little bit to give it some a little bit of graceful curve. If you don't enjoy this, you shouldn't be doing it. I think that's what it comes down to. And I enjoy this kind of stuff. You know, you can always you can always put a little bit of art into these kind of things. I could have just made this a you know straight shape, but I like the curve profile there, so I'm going to try to replicate that here. Try to round this side off a little bit more, and with that. I'm going to do the big one and take a little bit more material off my pass. I don't want to take too much away from where that hole is going to be drilled because you're going to need some material there. Just kind of give that a delicate shape. Okay, let's check that. The dog bone shape of this little weight could also be done with a hand file, but I happen to have this little belt sander handy and it saved me a little bit of time. And then we'll just take out some material. I think that gives me a little better control. And I'll start to feather these edges. And I don't want to clamp it so tight that I take all the bend out of it either. So I'm going to see what I can get away with here. Let's try this. This seems to be working. Nice and easy. There we go. Now let's see if we can avoid losing this thing. Our next step is to make this little upright piece. This one's a little bit thinner material, but I think it'll work just fine. So the first thing I want to do is round the edges and then I'll cut it to length. Makes for a nice easy contour. 
and put it right next to it. That looks about right. That looks centered. Looks centered to me. How about that one? Close enough. Whoa, look at that. Right on the money. Now let's figure out what length we need it. First, figure out where my Sharpie's at. So the holes are there. We're going to cut right about there. Now we need to do our second one, which is here. Looks like there are no holes that need to be drilled, so we just need to cut it to length. Now we have our upright piece. It looks like it needs a little relief on these upper inside corners to allow the ratchet to pass by. And then we can round these off just to give them a nice shape. I need something to weld to, and if I make it too thin, it'll be difficult to weld. So we got this piece here. It's a winding drum made from metal tubing. So I'm just gonna mark in with my Sharpie roughly where I want the center of this hole to be. Right about there. And then let's figure out our offset from the back, which is right about there. I think that'll work. And we'll do a pilot hole since we've got the drill handy. 0.646. So we just need to find the step that gets us there or slightly larger. We'll just go in as far as we need to and then check it. So it looks like we're going to be at one, two, three, fourth one from the top. Why don't we raise the table up? I think we were out of throw on the quill. Okay, one more notch and we're there. The other thing we need to do is drill the mounting holes on the back flange. And I hesitate to touch this thing right now because I know it's going to burn me. So let's do it that way. Let's, let's play this game. We'll do our layout here on the bench vise. Mirror image for the other one. I'll just measure up, find the center of the hole. Looks like it's right on half an inch. So that's easy. We'll just make our scribe marks. How far from the edge? 0.15 to the center of the hole. So we can do our little cross right there and right there. As you might expect, my camera battery went dead halfway through the process, so um, I'll show you what I did in the meantime. I welded this upright and then this washer, and that serves as the, the stabilizer for this whole assembly. Just added fills of weld there and then smoothed it out with the grinder to help it look like a large cast piece. Then the second thing I did, I made up my, my little serrated washer and the flat washer on top. And I just use the file to make a square hole and then a little tack weld to hold the two together. When I did the little tack weld, I left a little bit of that weld on the inside to sort of locate it within the bore of this so that it can't slip out sideways. It's kind of captive in there. And then I put the, the tube or the barrel through the bottom and aligned it and I pressed pretty tight on this upper piece because I didn't want it to be super loose in there. And I also don't want it to fall out. When you remove this for transport, 
you don't want this to be able to rattle out. And then did another fillet around the bottom and then ground that smooth. The strap on the bottom was made out of a piece of uh, square tube steel. In fact, here's the other half. I just made a slot and then cut a couple of different widths of that U-shape to see which one looked best. And I chose a, a little bit wider one. That functions pretty well. You just pivot that over and you can drop the handbrake down. This little riser, I just made a fillet of weld around the base. These are just little number four screws and they're secured with Loctite to nuts on the back, just enough that they could pivot. They're not super tight in there. So there's a basic principle. When, when you're working with the prototype setting a handbrake, it's usually best to have the engineer put a 20 pound set on the, the brake setup so it pulls everything tight and then you just lock it in place with this handbrake wheel. And then when you wanna kick it off, you flip this over and usually you have to tighten just slightly and it will disengage like that and then it'll unwind. Next up, we're gonna make a handbrake wheel. So I found this old faucet handle and uh, a lot of times when I look at the old ones, they're kind of inverted like that. They kind of dish upward. I don't know if they were put on wrong, but I've, I've seen several that way. So I took a flapper wheel and smoothed that out. And probably the easiest way to do this would be to just tap some threads in here, run a little bolt down and hold it. Let's do a little field trip. Let's check this out because I just happen to have one in my backyard. Ah, look at that. Isn't that convenient? So there's a, a nut with a couple washers and it looks like it's peened over on top so the nut can't come off. And then this just keys into the square part of the shaft. So likely that casting is squared in the middle and then that would go down to the car. I found this little number eight, 32 thread per inch screw and it's got a nice head that almost looks like a nut. So when that's all painted up, I think it'll look fine. So I'll have a little washer under it and that'll hold this right in there. So I need to find the center there and then punch a little dimple in it and cut some thread. A machinist would call this a scale, not a ruler, but you can call it whatever you want. What I'm gonna do is try to pick up the corners and just scribe a little X like so and see if that looks kind of centered. It's pretty close. I'll do it a couple times and take an average. Central limit theorem says that the more samples you take, the closer to the actual statistical average you are. So like if if 100 people guess how many jelly beans are in a jar, you better get a pretty good average compared to if one person tries it. If a million people guess it, you're probably going to find almost nearly the true average, the actual number of what they are in the jar. It's another useless fact brought to you by me. Right about there. Let's do it. Ooh, yeah, we got it. I'm going to drill a little bit deeper than the screw that I just lost. 832. Let's just check whenever you tap. If you've got the part that you're trying to thread, check the threads. You'll see if they line up perfectly and kind of lock in, you've got the right thread pitch. These taps, you can see they start out a little bit shallow thread and it kind of works up to full thread height. So we probably need to be in about half an inch to get into the good threads. If I had a set of bottoming taps, they would go with full thread all the way to the end and I wouldn't have to drill quite as deep. It's better to drill a little bit deeper in this case than not go far enough and then break the tap off in there. And then you're stuck with trying to figure out how to salvage the part. So a number 832, you can look this stuff up online. Here's the chart. So it says tap sizes on that column there, and you just walk down until you find it. And there it is, 832. So we want a drill bit that's about 0 0.1360 inches, or the nearest one in the neighborhood is about 964. So we could also do 1 8. Another thing to keep in mind is sometimes the drill bits, even though it's 1 8, will actually drill slightly wider. 
So maybe I'll go with an eighth and I'll try the tap. And if it's too tight, we'll go up to that next size. Square that up as best we can. And then tighten it. The next step is to clamp the tap into the drill press and then get it started in the hole. You can feel it engage and then once it engages you can use the handle. Okay now we're engaged. Let's release the chuck. We'll go by hand with the tap handle that I just lost. This is good. Pays to have good tools when you need them like this. You can get away with some cheap things in some areas, but when it comes to cutting threads, not good when you're fighting yourself. So you can feel the resistance, and then you back up and burnish the threads and break the chip off. It's possible that you can build up so much chippage in there that when you go to pull the tap out, they get jammed sideways and you break the tap off. And then you have the privilege of making that part again, unless you have access to like an EDM process where they can blast that thing out. Sometimes if the tap's big enough, or if there's a little chunk sticking out, you can get on it with some pliers and try to work it out, or you can even break it in pieces. If you hit it with a chisel, some of the bigger taps will just shatter if you knock them with a chisel and then you can pull the pieces out. But let's not do that. It's expensive. It's frowned upon. No one wants to be frowned upon. Get those threads a little bit smoother. <laughs> Every time you run the tap in and out, it makes sure that kind of cuts away at anything that's interfering. So look at that. There it is, finger tight. That second pass really cleaned things up. They call it Loctite Blue, even though it's in a red container. I, I haven't figured that out. Somebody probably knows, but not I. It doesn't take much. That may be more than necessary, but we don't plan on taking this apart anytime soon. Let's make a big mess here with the Loctite. Let's get it all over everything. That's how we roll. There we have it. Handbrake wheel with a little paint. That's going to look great. There's our final assembly. Be able to rotate that if you really want to play brakeman or something. But that's it. So we've got all the working parts. All I have to do now is drill the end of the car out for a couple of mounting bolts, and we're in good shape. The next step is we want to get this handbrake assembly attached to the end of the car. So I measured the other one and it's about five and a half inches on center here. So I indicated a mark there. And then we want the top of this assembly to be pretty much at a height where the handbrake wheel will sit flush with the deck when it drops down into the little recess. So I just use a Sharpie, put two little dots there marking out these two hole locations. And we'll drill those and uh, get ready to attach this. The other thing I did is I made some pins. So we've got, I started with some 3 8 inch bolts that I had and I put them in the lathe and turned down the head to a nice little nub. And then on the other end, this happened to be one I'd made before. Um, I turned the threads off. You can leave the threads on, it doesn't really matter on this. Um, and then drill them through for a cotter pin. This whole assembly is what holds the trucks on. The bottom of the truck has a hollow cutout, so this spacer allows me to put a washer on top of it. The other thing I want to do on one end is I've got this washer between the bolster and the bottom of the frame here, and that allows that truck to pivot just a little bit more than if it's just flat on flat bolster. So we we'll have that in there between the truck and the frame. And then this spacer will be on the bottom of the truck, a big washer, and then finally this pin that holds it all together. We also wanna make sure that we have access to our coupler pin, which is hidden under this board. So 
what I'll do, I'll square these up with the frame. And this is resting on that board and loud noise warning. Just bonk it a couple times and you can see there's an impression right there. So I'm just going to make a hole slightly bigger than that. And then that will help accommodate that pin. So if I ever want to change couplers, I can reach in and push that through. We also want to do the same thing for the truck set pins here, but uh, I'm going to wait until I get those decking boards firmly in place and then I'll do the same thing. We're going to center punch these holes here. A little bit of all, a little all on the drill. Make sure that we got our holes lined up right. We may have to hog them out a little bit if they don't. Ooh, why don't we put this in right side up? I think that'd be a step in the right direction. There's that one. And there's that one. Sometimes you win. That's looking really good. So run some nuts and some washers up on that. That'll be all done. That'll do it for this episode. Stay tuned for episode three, where we finish off the decking and put everything together. If you're just tuning in for the first time, hit subscribe and you'll catch all the updates.